Welcome to Open Mind UFO Radio. I am your host, Alejandro Rojas, and I have with me the illustrious Martin Bad to the Bone Willis. Bad to the Bone. That's right. Yeah. Yes, I'm here. How are you Thank doing? You. I'm doing great. How are you doing? It's cold here, though. In Is it? Maine. It's kind of chilly like, here. It's, it's at least goodness. in the 60s. Uh-huh. Yeah, we're in single digits here in Maine. Whoa, that yeah. is really flinging cold. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. January's the cold month, and when I lived in Denver, that's when it got the coldest, especially early January, so I am happy not to be anywhere cold. I bet, I bet. So, um, my guest, I'm very excited about my guest today. Uh, he created this great video. He works in the AV field. He's like, I know, a director of photography for this company, Um does lots of work in television and stuff. So he got interested in the 2004 Nimitz uh, Carrier Strike Group case. This was a case that uh, was shown to the world at the New York Times uh, in their story last December, um, December 2017, the story that revealed the whole Pentagon thing with Lou Elizondo and the whole thing. You know, there were, they talked about this Nimitz case. Uh, of course, since then, you and I have interviewed several people regarding this case. But what David Beatty did, and I, if you're one of the 1.4 million viewers who have seen this on YouTube, wow. he created this 15-minute video that goes, you know, minute by minute of what happened during that encounter um, Commander David Fravor had and his colleagues when they zeroed in on this Tic Tac looking UFO and uh, it's got great CG it's got footage from the Navy uh, it's got interspersed with uh, an interview with David Fravor he was able to get permission from to the stars to use their interview so it is really really good and I had a great time talking to David Beatty about uh, this video so if you haven't seen it you gotta see it of course the link will be in the show notes and uh, I think everybody's going to really enjoy this interview. He is, of course, very well versed on this case. Wow! And I have not seen it. And uh, but as soon as we get done, by golly, that's the first thing I'm going to do. Nice, nice, yeah. nice, nice. It's going to be a lot of fun. So, uh, so yeah, that's the show today. Um, but before we get into the show, of course, we always spend some time, you and I to talk some UFO news. That's right. And, uh, uh, you know, I looked, um, like you do, I'm sure, every single day, and to see what's in the news about UFOs. And, boy, is it heavy with Project Blue Book. First of all, oh, yeah. the New York Times, Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal, uh, published a story, Project Blue Book, is based on a true story, and here it is. And that that's in the New York Times. That came out um on January 15th the other day and a great article check it out and uh, so as I'm looking around for news uh, again I see more and more about Project Blue Book nothing new as far as sightings to speak of there's a yeah. couple things out there this but is anyway, really cool can I can I mention something sure. about the New York Times article yeah yeah go ahead what I love about that article what I think is great well and interesting is, you know, I know Kane, Leslie Kane, who wrote that article, along with Ralph Blumenthal, two of the authors of the New York Times story that broke the whole Pentagon story. Um, just one of the people is missing. But these guys are the ones who broke the story, wrote this Pentagon or this Project Blue Book story. But they use some very strong verbiage, like in the earlier one about the Pentagon, Leslie said they had to fact check everything and they were very careful. But like, here's one of the quotes from this new Project Blue Book one. 
When Project when Blue Book closed in late 1969, the Air Force flatly lied to the American people, issuing a fact sheet claiming that no UFO had ever been a threat to national security. They they are accusing the Air Force of lying in this, you know, in this sentence, uh, without. Yeah justifying why they're saying that. Now, I think I can make an argument that would justify what they're saying, but still, uh, you know, I'm surprised they weren't, uh, you know, required to make that argument in this article. That is a real good point. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Pretty strong stuff. It's essentially New York Times saying, you know, the Air Force had lied and, and it was misrepresented and all that sort of thing. I don't think that anyone's going to be shocked to be honest with you, <laughs> that a branch of the government lied lied to its people. But um, about UFOs, yeah. I think people, for some yeah. reason, you know, they get a little more skeptical about that. But um, that's true. It's true. Yeah, it's yeah. A very interesting story. Yeah. So the other um, the ar- other article that caught my eye in the news today, uh, it was actually um, came out on January 9th, but still, it's uh, hot in the news, and it's uh, basically the History Channel's. Um, own website and it's titled seeing a ufo in the 1950s you could report this in this easy questionnaire and say you're out walking in the desert and see a flash of light in the sky that you can't identify if this happened between 1952 and 1969 you could report that um, light to project blue book at the u.s air force project to investigate un- unidentified flying objects aka ufos and uh, it was the longest-running official government inquiry into the UFOs uh, that we know of, I should say, uh, based at, um, at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And anyway, if you look at the form, it's really great. They have this original scan of the actual form that you would fill out, and which is now unclassified. And, uh, and you know, it starts out um, confidential U.S. Air Force technical information sheet. And then it goes on to, you know, all the questions like, you know, when did you see this? Um, What time of day was it? Um, And uh, and then they asked also about the moon and the the stars. Yeah. And uh, was it bright? You know, what was brighter in the background? And did the object um, stand still at any time? And then it goes on, you know, about sounds um, you know, what type of sound did this create, if any? And then it has uh, silent as the first one, um, buzzing and, you know, et cetera. And yeah. uh, was it fuzzy or blurred? Anyway, there, it's a great, great little form. Anyone can check it out. You know, it's just, uh, it, you'll probably put that in the show notes maybe, huh? Uh, sure. Yeah, send me the link. But uh, <laughs> there was at Comic-Con when they did that activation for Project Blue Book, And uh, I don't know if you remember, I talked about it. I post a a Facebook Live of me going through there. But Mm -hmm. um, they used the actual form. So they used that form when, you know, you went in and you sat down and they said, have you had a UFO sighting? Oh, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. And if you didn't have a sighting, you can just continue on through the rest of the uh, activation, which is kind of a display, you know. And activation is the first time they're they're showing, hey, we're doing this cool TV show. So, yeah. it's like activating the whole marketing uh, of the show. And uh, some people walked on, but most people had sightings to explain, which was kind of neat. And then they use that form. They ask those questions, and then they pass that form on to their sketch artist. So as you enjoyed the display, um, they would tell you, you know, come back in 10 minutes, and uh, we'll have your sketch of your sighting done. So that was really cool. Uh-huh. But, yeah, they use that form. It's a great form. I and didn't know. I didn't uh, know that they actually used the the original form when you did that. I remember you yeah. telling about the whole experience. Yeah, it's pretty wow. cool. And uh, you know that form essentially, you know, move on in other groups built off of that. I can see that. I mean, there's a lot of really, you know, great information that, and uh, it's funny. It's like circle one, and you know, uh, you know, and they have all different types of examples of whatever it is. Um, you know, the questions involved, like, mm-hmm. uh, what was the condition of the sky? Bright daylight, dull daylight, bright twilight, just a trace of daylight, you know, that type of stuff. Yeah. Very, very detailed. It yeah. it'll just narrows it right down, you know, question after question. Yeah. So, yeah, regarding Blue Book, yeah. if I can ask you, I brought you up in an interview with Michael Hanks this morning. Oh. 
And I we were talking it. about what okay. a chump you are. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you know, uh, Micah had asked me about Project Blue Book, and there's a little bit of this in the New York Times about how it's, it's you know, heavily fictionalized. And in my preview or review of the show, I said that too, you know, it is uh, got a lot of heavy on the fiction, but, um, and that seems to have inspired, like Micah brought up, a lot of anger and angst. Yes, in at least the online UFO community. And he Absolutely. laughed when I told him, he said, what do you think? And I said, well, that community gets upset about everything and they're freaking out. They're so negative about everything. I mean, uh, sure, you and I, for instance, are skeptical. We're careful to examine things, but they just love to tear people down, it seems like, and, and find, like, for instance, um, there's some new documents out about ATIP, and now they're all fighting about this. And these documents, mm-hmm. just because I brought it up to share with the audience, um, I tweeted about them. Nick Pope actually wrote an article uh, about them, which is linked on the Open Minds front page. And they don't really say much. They just talk about, here are some of the products from ATIP, meaning... Uh, and in the, what they mean are some of the scientific papers that came out of ATIP. And ATIP, of course, is this Pentagon UFO program that Luis Elizondo ran that was in the New York Times we talked about um, to back up to make sure everybody's caught up. But uh, so it didn't have a lot. But there were a lot of people who said, oh, they don't even believe this organization was real and that these guys are lying. And so now they were accusing Nick of, I guess, faking these documents, which doesn't surprise me. And he had to tweet guys, I did not make these documents up. They were sent to me via FOIA. And actually, there's a um, Federation of American Scientists researcher who also got these, who posts this on their FAS.org site. So yeah, they're real. And they show that the, the group was real. It shows the name. But that's just an example. These people ripping and tearing and Oh, no, they're fake. They aren't even real. And they're all lying to us. So I mean, uh, this is... Yeah. doesn't surprise me about the negativity, but I was just, I brought you up because, you know, I've interviewed Paul Hynek. You got to interview Paul and Joel together with Lee. Lee called me right after the show, by the oh, way, and did. said, guess yeah. who I just talked to? But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, they are very happy with the show. They got to be involved yes. with making sure their father was represented properly. I think mm-hmm. Aiden Gillen's doing a great job, and Hynek is like, a mega hero. I mean, he's like, wow, look at this one scientist against the Air Force and he's learning all this stuff. He's a great molder ish type of character. And um, the show is not accurate completely, but uh, it's historical fiction. I mean, I'm a right. fan of historical fiction. Not all historical fiction. It varies from very way off base, but kind of getting the essence of the period of time to um, fairly accurate fairly because you can't be that accurate you can't be completely accurate in a fiction show um and and encapsulate the story so i don't have a huge problem i wish it would it's always nice when it's more factual but it's not that big of a deal to me um and here's just real quick two points one point being that it's bringing uh, the net gain is that it's bringing a ton of attention to blue book that it existed and through the eyes of the best person Heineck, who was a real scientist who was a skeptic who after looking at the evidence found it was real so all of these people and you're seeing p- stories pop up all over the place about ufos and project blue book and here's a project blue book that was in our town you know Here's the UFO sightings from 2018, all related to this Project Blue Book. So it's brought so much positive um, um, attention to the UFO field and research and interest in it that I think it's been a real positive. And then on top of that, the second thing is that the History Channel is creating these articles like you just talked about Mm -hmm. um, that are explaining the facts in the background. And they're very you know, compelling UFO stories because they're using compelling UFO cases in the show. So these articles are great that are just further getting information out there. And I don't know of any other show. You can tell me if you know differently, but I don't think I've seen any other show where they released 
articles like this in in conjunction with their historical fiction show to show that the reality I don't think so either and you know I've been battling out <laughs> with some people on Facebook and bringing that up uh, as part of my argument into why I think it's a a great show and if someone wants to um, you know want more fact than they should watch a documentary and this is never stating anything other than what you said historical fiction um, and you know as far as speaking to both Joel and Paul Hynek um, they are very happy with all the uh, all the work that Aiden did as the actor to try to I mean he actually calls them and asks them you know certain questions and and wants to make sure that he would you know, go along the same lines in the way that um, um, Heineck would do. And uh, they they are happy. They said, uh, you know, basically, well, you know, some things we wish, you know, didn't happen or whatever, but, you know, we just overall were very happy with all the, you know, attention um, that is given to, uh, to Heineck's character. Mm -hmm. And full disclosure... You and I have received these friggin' awesome, I don't know if you knew I got one, but I saw in your social media you got one, and I had yeah. shared on social media when I got mine, Oh, these attache cases that are real leather, that real came nice. with some cool, very nice, I mean, that's something you could use forever, and um, they came with these blue book files, and, and right. a pen, and some cool stuff inside of them. Even and candy. <laughs> yeah, can, lots of candy. So they're freaking cool. And uh, But I got to say, at least for me, uh, even if, you know, I think the audience knows. I'm very honest with the audience. So if uh, even if I didn't like the show, that cool package, I still would have said, hey, but the marketing people are awesome because they sent me this package even though their show sucked. I would still say, you know, <laughs> what my complaints are about the show. But overall, I'm genuinely enjoying the show, and I'm, I'm loving the results. Um, you know, you and I pay attention to the mainstream media and all this positive attention UFOs are getting. Are That's you right. swayed? Do you think you're biased from your cool attache? <laughs> no, that's not going to buy me over. Um, I just really, I I enjoyed the whole concept of it right from the beginning. And, uh, you know, I, I think one or two, when you and I have had, uh, you know, access to the screeners for up to the first six episodes. And I think one in particular, one of the episodes goes just way out, way out there too far. Hmm. But other than that, um, you know, you get involved with the characters and they're, they're, very likable, and I, I just think it really the show really grows on you. And I think, um, I think it's it's going to be a really good success. It's already had, I think, the first show had over three million viewers, mm -hmm. and um, so I think it's just going to grow. And I hopefully they'll have more than one season because I want to find out more <laughs> of those stories. Even though, uh, as we're both talking about, they're not exact, um, but it will get people to look into the real cases. Yeah, and uh, you know. I think it's it's all good. I don't see, I can't really see anything negative about it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you and I could do a show on the negativity in the UFO field alone, unfortunately. I know. I know. I mean, you, we're, we're just talking about some negativity that's uh, going on out there that people have sent us that we both just don't see, at least currently, a point to kind of get into. But that's typically the case. I mean... There's so much great positive information to share. And in this world, like this, you mm -hmm. know, interview I'm just about to have with Beatty um, about this incredible Nimitz case. And, you know, David Fravor talking all over the place to major media, a, a commander, a pilot, you know, jet fighter pilot, well respected, talking about his dogfight with uh, this Tic Tac UFO. This sort of stuff has never happened before. Mm, um, right. The government, politicians calling in Luis Elizondo and other David Fravor and others to talk about UFOs, um, you know, and, and there's been several congressional subcommittees that have done this. And so it's an incredible time of discovery. And uh, that's why I think we just there's a lot of data and real information to come over and to look into. And, and that's what I think people need to pay attention to um, and not dis 
get distracted by people trying to tear each other down for whatever reason. I don't get it. I don't know why. Um, it reminds me of this uh, saying this girl I knew had. You know, blowing out other people's candles doesn't make yours shine any brighter. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, if people could, I don't know if it's egos or whatever it is or sour grapes or I don't know what it is. But if they could remove that part of it and just look at what it truly is, you know, um, I'm talking about Project Blue Book, the, the series. Hmm. Then, you know, if they could just somehow not be offended that it's not following the exact uh, truth of what happened and that it's it's made for entertainment as well as uh, also giving many tidbits of factual information um, available. You know, that's like you said, that's I don't think anyone's ever done that before. Yeah. Yep. So I don't see anything at all wrong with it and there are some people out there also i will will say the other way around not all negative there are people out there that are writing it's awesome i love it you know so yeah i mean i've got a lot of the ufo field yeah Yeah. i've got a lot of listeners i've seen where they say well i don't see a problem with it i think it's pretty cool and i've even got some yeah that are saying it's awesome i love it it's so great so um yeah everybody's got their opinion and everything i think it's just getting so like yeah let's kill it And it also shows a disconnect. And I think this is a problem is that when you've got like uh, yourself or the field has a complete disconnect with the general public, that's a problem. That means that you're not connecting with them, that whatever it is you're doing Mm. is not something that is really something that is going to, you know, gain their interest or support. And um The general public doesn't know the real background or the history, and they're excited about the show. The show's doing really well. So I think that it's advantageous for us then to figure out, well, how can we plug into this uh, attention and uh, get feed the public more credible information so they do understand about it? And, um, you know, that's what we've been doing with our shows. That's what I've been trying to do with my articles on Den of Geek and elsewhere. And, um, And that's exciting. You know, you're going back into the history of this as far as, you know, the modern history, what they say, beginning in 1947 and the Nathan Twining memo. A lot of people don't, Mm. you know, that I've actually sent that to. They said, this is fake. This isn't real. You know, like it doesn't seem possible that the Air Force would actually write, you know, flying discs and, uh, you know, their thoughts of them. Um, What do you think about that memo in general? Do you think? Well, here's the problem that I think what's happened with all of this, um, um, you know, hoaxing and fake. There's so much that is fake and a hoax out there. And this is why I think, you know, um, this whole MJ-12 stuff and everything, which I think many of us have demonstrated is extremely dubious. Mm -hmm. We don't need to fall back on dubious information because there's very credible information out there. I think that, uh, you know, the Air Force Times wrote a a story about Project Blue Book. And in it, they talked about the Pentagon Project. And they ended it with, you know, this demonstrates the government is uh, interested in uh, unidentified aerial phenomenon. And I I think that's uh, that's the whole point. That's what we've been arguing out for in the past. And, you know, we've got this video at Open Minds TV about the military secrecy. And we go over the history of Blue Book, but after Blue Book, even though they're denying they're not interested, we're showing that they are. So this dialogue has been that the Air Force concluded there's nothing to it and blah, blah, blah. But it's not true that everybody in the government or everybody in the Air Force came to that conclusion. This has been a debate since the beginning up until now. And yes, there was a very big contingent that believed that it could be extraterrestrial. They wrote uh, at least a couple reports. We've got this memo from Twining. We uh, we know from Ruppelt, the guy who ran Project Blue Book for the first time, really kind of the guy responsible for getting it rolling, um, and his accounts of how, you know, the first analysis on UFOs that the Air Force looked into, they said it could be extraterrestrial in nature. So they were willing to go down that route. And we have a whole history of people, Fravor included, saying, I think what I encountered is unworldly. Um, Charles mm-hmm. Hall in the Air Force, he felt the same way. So, yeah. Um, yeah. All good stuff. And mm-hmm. we're out of time, aren't we? We are out of time. So thank you so much for joining us again, Martin. 
absolutely my pleasure. All right. We will be right back with David Beatty right after this break. Welcome back to the show. I am your host, Alejandro Rojas, and we have a great guest for the first time, Dev Beatty. Hello. How are you? Hey, Alejandro. I'm doing great. Uh, Glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yes. I'm so happy to be talking to you because I think what you did is really important, and uh, luckily it's doing well. But I guess to begin with, how did you come up with this idea? What compelled you to do it? Well, obviously... For the people that know and follow the topic, um, you know, last, the last couple of years, December 2017 was when the New York Times article appeared. And, you know, I had always been involved in ufology, um, you know, almost my entire life. And when that article came out, I started doing some research um, uh, specifically about the ATIP program and some of the cases that Um, were being released to the public, um, specifically the case um, with the USS Nimitz. And there were several articles that were out there on the Internet, um, in addition to the New York Times article. And so that was the first, you know, kind of inkling of, oh, wow, that's such a cool story. Um, I wonder what that looked like for those pilots that were flying off of Nimitz. What did they see? And it kind of sparked my imagination of, um, ah, how could that be visualized? So I think that those were the first weeks where I started, you know, that inkling of what I could do as a filmmaker. Um, A lot of um, my past work has not been involving UFOs. It's been involving more uh, nonfiction documentary and other commercial projects. You know, that's my career. And I haven't done a lot um, with UFO cases, but... um, I think this was the first one. So that's really, to answer your question, how I kind of first started the the Nimitz Encounter film. Mm -hmm. Well, what's also great about your film is that you, the people you work with. So for instance, and I know it's hard to do um, because I have so many people calling me, seeing if I can help, is to get to the stars to kind of uh, lend a hand. And they did in that they lent you or let you use uh, their interview with Commander David Fravor, one of the pilots Mm -hmm. there. And he um, did this interview with To the Stars Arts and Sciences, and and they allowed you to use that. Yeah, that's correct. Obviously, when I first started, I didn't have any budget. Um, You know, going back to that, it's this film was not sponsored by anybody and it didn't, you know, um, have any angel funders or anything like that. So I had to figure out how I could um, work on the project without a big outlay of cash, um, specifically in the case of film documentary films. Oftentimes there's travel involved, um, a lot of research <clears throat> going to the locations and interviewing the witnesses and so on. Did not have any of that money. And um, after the To the Stars Academy uh, community of interest page was posted, they had this really nice interview with Commander David Fravor, you know, a Na- U.S. Navy pilot and hero. And, you know, I was really blown away with his interview. And um, in the beginning process, while I was thinking how I could put it together, I knew that if I could do some recreations and I could get some Navy footage, um, in addition to his interview, I could probably put something together. So I reached out to, um, to the Stars Academy. They had uh, a media portal, so to speak, on their website where you could you know, reach out to them if you had a request. And I did ask if I could use some excerpts from that particular interview in a short film that I was making that you know, was pretty much not, for pro- non- for, not for profit and that I was going to give for free to the UFO in the you know, worldwide community. And I didn't hear anything for a while, and I was kind of getting disappointed. But then I did get a um, an email from Carrie DeLong saying that, you know, as long as I didn't just take the whole thing and use it all, I'll, you know, copy it, that I could use some excerpts. Um, so that gave me my first start of doing the production. That's awesome. 
Yeah, because that adds so much, and it's a great interview. Um, when you put this together, I guess, uh, I know you have spoken recently with Kevin Day. At least I saw, I think, on the UFO News Network, you had an interview with him recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've known Kevin since like the very beginning when he first came out on Facebook telling mm. the story. And <clears throat> I also have a, uh, a closed Facebook group that he's a member of. So um, since that very beginning, um, you know, so those very beginning days when I was formulating, you know, what <laughs> what I was going to do with uh, the movie, I, I brought Kevin in, you know, and I was, you know, bouncing ideas off him. And specifically showing him the script that I had, you know, the rough draft of the script that I had, asking him if, you know, to look at that for accuracy based on his memory of the events. So he was very involved in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And I guess getting into the events of uh, that are portrayed in your documentary here, um, I'm not as familiar. I need to interview mm -hmm. him and I will soon, hopefully, sure. uh I'm not as familiar with his role, but essentially he was a radar guy, right? And he was, um, mm -hmm. so was he one of the first to spot this on radar? Yeah. Um, Kevin was assigned to the USS Princeton, which is a guided missile carrier, um, guided, guided missile cruiser, which, you know, is with the uh, carrier strike group. And its role is basically to use this sophisticated radar tracking weapon system uh, one of the most powerful uh, radar tracking systems that the U.S. Navy has. And on that ship is the um, Combat Information Center that has all of the displays and, uh, you know, sensors and uh, weapons uh, guidance systems of the ship on there. He worked in there. His role primarily was an air intercept controller, or AIC, and... What they did is, you know, when the, the planes were in the air, they helped guide those pilots to targets. You know, it is a warfighting vessel, and that's what they mainly did. So they were trained to, you know, look at the air radar, and when they had enemies, um, other perhaps adversaries um, on radar, they could um, vector fighters and other planes towards those targets. And Kevin was, like, a senior chief, which is... You know, in the Navy, he had spent, you know, a number of years to reach that rank, that, that enlisted rank. And like in the CIC, he was sort of in charge of that department. He also, um, uh, uh, of note, is he graduated from the Top Gun School. Um, and you know that from the movie, but they also had Top Gun for the air intercept controllers that were on the ground working with these fighters. And um, he participated in that. And, and so he's a Top Gun as well. Hmm. Wow, that's cool. So he sees this thing on radar, and this is, you know, while they're doing their exercises, and uh, it seems like it's a, for the Princeton, it's a pretty solid uh, hit. So, uh, and correct me or, and clarify mm -hmm. anything that I sure. miss. So they scramble the jets, including Fravor. Well, here, let me, yeah. let me preface, uh, I'll, get, I'll get to that. Great. Incredibly enough, um, and you probably have heard this, in the week before that event with the jet, right, um, Kevin would hang out there sometimes looking at the radar screens. And at night, you know, even if he was off duty, sometimes he'd be down there in CIC. And they kept seeing these objects appearing on radar near Catalina Island. And they would appear almost coming from above 60,000 feet. They would they can only scan up with a radar so high in the air, but um, they would appear in sometimes groups of like six to ten um, objects. And oftentimes they would descend down to about 24,000 feet, stop, and then begin going in a southern direction at approximately 120 knots. And it's very unusual because jets and planes and other aircraft that are at 28,000 feet don't go 120 knots that's like a cessna or something you know mm -hmm. um so it was very odd um to kevin and they took note of it these objects didn't appear to be any sort of threat to the carrier so they would they were watching them and this occurred for you know several days leading up to the actual jets um, where they saw these objects not just one but groups of them mm -hmm. yeah 
So at least he was aware that there were uh, unknown objects kind of in the area. But I'm guessing then this was the first time where, wow, now we've got one nearby, um, Mm -hmm. one that I can scramble jets on. Yeah, so on, you know, the 14th was the the November 14th was the first day they were going to do an air defense exercise where during this work work up period, this two week work up period or however long it was out there, like maybe the whole month um, that they were going to have the fighter jets launching in the um, Hawkeye E2 um, planes launching and in the air. And so Kevin briefed the captain or talked to the captain of the USS Princeton and said, look, we have one of these objects right now. We have these guys that are up there in the jets. We should uh, vector them to t- go take a look and investigate this thing and see what it is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, and and I gather this from the documentary that the, the radar plane, so essentially um, they also send along with these guys a, a plane with some strong radar so that can give them some closer real-time, I guess, look at what's going on. But that thing was having a problem tracking or, or finding this object. That's correct. Um, the the Hawkeye allows them to get up above the, you know, the whole airspace there around the carrier. And um, it has its own, you know, huge circular radar dish above the aircraft spinning around. I think it's like a 20-foot, you know, dish up there. And they were having trouble um, tracking it with their radar. But the Princeton's radar, the in the Aegis system, it's called the Spy-1 radar. Um, and they actually were able to track it pretty well. So um, while the Hawkeyes roll after the fighters launch and take off is to kind of um, direct the flight, sort of air traffic control, if you will, um, in the sky, they weren't able to um, direct the fighters to this object because they weren't able to track it. Mm -hmm. So what happened was um, Princeton contacted them um, after they briefed the captain and said, you know, okay, guys, we're going to take control of these fighter jets. Um, The call sign was Fast Eagle. That was the fighter jets. And they're going to, we're going to take control of Fast Eagle. Um, So, you you know, they would be handing off control to Princeton, Mm -hmm. um, Kevin Day and his crew on Princeton. So... There, uh, Fravor and his Fast Eagle One and uh, his co-pilot, uh, Fast Eagle, or not co-pilot, but uh, the other plane he was flying with. Um, yeah. And would it be accurate to say wingman? Yeah, like the he he would be the lead flight, and then he would have a wingman um, that's the second F A T and F um, with two people. So each jet has two individuals in it: the pilot and the weapons system officer, Wizzo, who ride in the back, and they man the radar navigation and communication system of the aircraft mm-hmm so aircraft one is is fravor and and uh, and then aircraft two is fast eagle two um, mm-hmm. which I know at least I've been told by some of the guys um, that they were not releasing the name of this person although I guess in your yeah. film we do see the gender that's right um, the gender was confirmed. Um, yes, and from uh, what of, I understand, the, that's accurate too. Yeah, one of the one of, back in the beginning, one of the um, friends of Dave Fravor who wrote an article named uh, Francesco Paco Charici, Paco's his call sign, um, mentioned that the wingman was a she, mm-hmm. and I kind of um, no one had noticed that. A lot of the news media was w- were saying that uh, Lieutenant Commander Jim Clean Slate clean being his call sign um was the wingman which is technically correct because jim was riding in the back seat of the second jet and the jet itself is they're both wingmen if they're in the wingman jet so hmm. it was a female in the front and jim slate in the back of that wingman fa-18 mm-hmm. and yeah, then we I- don't know we don't know um who was in the back of uh commander fravor's jet that name has not been released mm-hmm Right, and and I don't believe her name has been released either. No. Right. She, uh, Paco told me she does not want to come forward. She wants nothing to do with this, and the mm. whole event wigged her out, according to Paco. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so, at least, yeah, I, I had heard it was a, a female pilot. In fact, I think I was given the name. I think I knew, but told, yeah, they're not sharing that information. So, that's there, interesting. Yes, 
it's been released on the internet. I've seen it, but I think I know, have too. Yeah. Out of respect to them, I mean, they are Me too. Uh, U.S. Mi- military heroes, and if someone doesn't want their name used, um, I'm all for that. You know? Exactly. I agree 100% with you. So they're racing towards the object, and mm-hmm. um, they actually had a hard time getting a visual at first. Mm-hmm. Right, and even before they got there, there was another um, pilot from the Marine Detachment, mm-hmm. the Marine Air de- uh, Wing of the carrier. He... Um, was vectored into the same area um, that this UFO or UA, you know UAP w- was reported, and he noticed a disturbance on the surface of the ocean down you know twenty thousand feet below him. They started seeing spotting this. Dis- the the sea was pretty calm, so it would have been a, a blue sea, and he's seeing like this white water thing like on the surface of the sea, and uh, his his name was. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Douglas Cheeks, Kurth Cheeks is his uh, call sign. And so he reported seeing that that um, water disturbance is what they described it as, kind of waves roiling sort of thing. And he didn't see anything more. He was kind of called off. They said, you know, return to base or whatever, as they had fast eagles approaching at the very uh, same time. So... When Fast Eagle Commander Fravor and his wingmen arrived at that location at about 20,000 feet, roughly, I don't know, they might have been like 50 miles from the carrier at that point, 50, 60, I think, um, they saw this same white water disturbance, which has been described in various ways as being maybe a hundred meters in the beginning some of the articles said a hundred 200 feet uh, commander fravor has used the reference of a 737 jet which is maybe a couple hundred feet mm-hmm. in length um in a recent interview he even went out as far as to say it almost had like the appearance of a cross like if you l- looked at a plane that was underwater you would see kind of the wings you know underwater he said it didn't. It wasn't that, but it would almost look like not a perfect circle. Um, and they described it as sort of like what may be a sea mount um, under a mountain that's just below the surface of the ocean um, would look like if waves were breaking over it. Hmm. So they didn't say ever say, at least I haven't heard, that they saw something under the water. They just described this um, white water on the surface. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then as Fravor, now, at and maybe you don't, mm-hmm. fr- at what point then, um, I think they, they were at the same altitude that they didn't drop, mm-hmm. or did they need to drop yeah. lower to, to be able to see the, the Tic Tac? You know, when they arrived on the scene, they were at around 20,000 feet, um, according to the records, you know, that had been produced. Um, and in my film, when you first um, see that white water, that's about what it would look like in using the CGI. Um, the camera is pretty physically real, so mm. I can put, place that camera at a, the same altitude and look at that, you know, How cool. 200 foot. Yeah, so it's kind of, you realize that, that when you start visualizing it, wow, that thing looked like, you know, the size of a, you know, a thumbnail or something like viewed from your eye height at the floor. It's tiny. And that's um, what I love about the film is that it gives you a better perspective of what they're looking at because I don't think yeah. people realize how difficult. Maybe if you're flying in a plane and you look at the ocean and try to mm-hmm. spot a boat or something. I mean, it's 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 yeah. hard. Yeah, really. And and that little whitewater would have been real small, um, <clears throat> probably a curiosity to, to to them. And I know that when they arrived, they were looking for uh, some type of craft unknown and unknown aircraft mm-hmm. imagine you know what's going through their mind they don't know that this is a you know quote unquote ufo they think it's an aircraft that they're sent to identify and they think maybe it's drug runners and a cessna maybe it's a, some lost um you know pilot out of california that got you know going in the wrong direction or something and they're thinking w- we're looking for an aircraft and then they see this thing in the water and they start thinking Maybe that's the aircraft, and now it crashed, and it's in the water. So they almost began thinking this could be a, like a search and rescue type thing. And mm. at that, that's kind of when 
Fravor decided to go down and, and take a little look. And I think, you know, the exact timing, um, they may have seen some movement uh, from that altitude. You could imagine, um, like you said, seeing something from 20,000 feet that's 47 feet long would be difficult. But it could be that they had descended, um, you know, down from 20,000. So now they're closer. And I believe that that's when Fravor, you know, picked it up in his um, backseater when they first saw him notice movement over the surface of this disturbance. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're staring at that and they see this object that appears white coming into their field of view that seems to be moving erratically over this disturbance. And um, we do have uh, one more piece of information that I wanted to ask you about that I passed yeah. up on, that I accidentally skipped. I shouldn't have, because at mm -hmm. least there was reason for them to be a little on edge because of a strange question that they got in route um, yeah. to the area, which uh, maybe yeah. you could cover that. Sure. Yeah, that's a good point. We forgot about that. So as they're on route, um, Commander Fravor, of course, being, you know, a senior pilot with lots of experience, the wing man or wing woman was new, a relatively new pilot. And they get a call from Princeton um, coming on the radio saying, you know, what, you know, Fast Eagle, report your loadout. And meaning, you know, what are your missiles? What are your air to air missile loadout or your cannon? highly unusual in a training scenario and uh i mean commander fravor said well we have these training missiles that really are just empty p tubes with no propellant that have seeker heads on them for use for training and they're not going to come off the jet so pretty much nothing and i know that that in the pilot report on to the stars academy the the co the wingmen was sort of concerned about this at that point mm -hmm. you know they she thought that maybe they were looking at some type of terrorist um attempt or something like that you know mm -hmm. so you know this was 2004 so it was on the minds of a lot of people that terrorists were using airplanes and i know that they became concerned um when they were asked about what kind of weapons they had yeah. are you aware if um either of or any of the four um in those two jets were aware of the Tic Tacs or at least the unknowns that were spotted in the area. When they it's went out there, were, uh -huh, go ahead. It's my understanding that they were not, mm. that when they were vectored or given a real world vector to intercept an unknown aircraft, that they didn't know anything about what had happened before, you know, on the Princeton's with Kevin Day. Mm -hmm. and that's a good question because I don't I don't remember if that's been asked specifically if they were given a briefing at all before. I don't know. Can't yeah, answer it. I'm curious too because another researcher you may know him, Robert Powell, um, mm -hmm. who I've had on the show, and and he's been looking into Nimitz. He, yeah. When he asked for uh, information, uh, when he was talking to Navy press. He had mentioned the Tic Tac UFO, and they said, oh, yeah, we know about the Tic Tac UFO. And he was shocked mm -hmm. that this was common knowledge. But, of course, it could have been this case or something else that mm -hmm. made it as, as popular. So, yeah. yeah. So I was curious of that. So essentially, and we're going to have to take a break here, uh, but okay. essentially as they're flying in to examine the area, they really – they don't know what they're looking for. They get this request mm -hmm. on whether they have weapons or not, um, yeah. which kind of makes things a little more strange, but they don't know what they're going to be looking for. Yeah, that's right. And you, they don't know what it is yet. So if you can imagine, they've just been told they wish they had weapons, you know, and mm -hmm. that they're going towards some kind of unknown aircraft that's not identified with a, um, you know, IFF, they call it, identified uh, friend or foe or any kind of, uh, um, radio that's been they've been able to communicate with this craft so mm -hmm. they're unsure you know and, and yeah. I think that the wingman was a little frightened by the whole thing yeah I can understand that that's really interesting so we've got to take a break right now uh, for those of you listening on the podcast it'll be just a short musical interlude and we'll be right back with David Beatty
Welcome back to Open Mind GFO Radio. I'm your host, Alejandro Rojas, and we have the uh, pleasure of having Dave Beatty on, who created this, of course, great documentary on the Nimitz UFO case from 2004 outside of San Diego. And we're at the point where Fravor has gotten close, and now he sees uh, the Tic Tac object. And one interesting thing that you just mentioned, and, and that is in your documentary, is that this object wasn't just sitting there. No, it was moving around erratically. Um, you know, and I think that's the first thing that, that Dave noticed was that it was behaving in a way that didn't make sense. It was kind of moving back and forth, you know, around this disturbance. He interpreted it that this thing was checking out the underwater disturbance like it was you know he kind of described it this disturbance as looking like a 737 he said this thing was by the wing on the right side kind of went up by the cockpit and was kind of like um checking out this uh water disturbance um and again i you know i don't think he saw it in iraq i you know again he didn't he's never said that he saw this uh white tic tac looking object going in the water or um, doing anything else other than just flying above it you know mm -hmm. um, I know that I know that the wingman jet um, they reported seeing the object at a little higher altitude like transitioning across their field of view at maybe 2,000 feet um, that's when the first time they picked it up but uh, Dave Fravor um, went down much lower like from 20,000 he um, told his wingman you know stay here in high cover I'm gonna go check this out so he just takes off and um, begins diving down uh, closer and closer to the water surface. Um, and um, I can t I can go keep going if you want, or you want yeah, to go for um, it. Yeah. So okay. So he's going down, and um, I believe that it was like maybe around ten thousand feet or so, or um, maybe a little less than that. That this object suddenly seems to take notice of him, like it begins pointing at him. And again, he describes it as a white porcelain-like um, tic-tac, you know, like a capsule with no discernible um, wings, propulsion, um, any kind of, um, you know, engines or any anything else. Um, he did at one point describe a couple little the appendages that he said he saw in the, the video later. Um so anyways, he, he's watching it and it seems to like turn and point at his jet and then begin coming up and he is passing it on the, like if you, it would be on his um, three o'clock, basically the right side of his jet, he's passing it and he begins a slow um, circle. The object it's coming up and it, it begins mirroring his circle. So now if you can imagine a big circle in the sky, um, he's on one side of the circle and this object is coming up on the other. And it's basically mirroring his turn rate. Um, as this dog fight begins with the UFO. So if you can imagine two fighter jets, they do the same thing. They're trying to get on each other's tail. Um, and it's almost a, an aggressive move when you have a turning circle like that, because it's like this other object's trying to get on my tail. Mm -hmm. Um, in, 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 you know, I guess in fighter tactics, that's what you do. So, you know, I think he was kind of concerned with this, you know. Right. You know, yeah. and it reminds me of Nick Pope. And I forget why. This might have been after Chicago Hair. Um, Nick Pope, who, of course, used to work for the Ministry of Defense investigating UFOs, had brought up on this Fox News interview that uh, just kind of threw it out there while they were asking about UFOs. There's been dogfights. And the host was mm -hmm. like, what? Dogfights? And he says, yes, yeah. essentially kind of a cat and mouse in the air. Not yeah. that there's been, you know, an exchange of fire or anything. And the host yeah. seemed absolutely shocked by that. But this is a perfect right. example of what he was talking about. Yeah, you know, if you do um, some research, you will find, <clears throat> you know, that there are cases of dog fights, mm -hmm. um, you know, some very famous ones. This one, you know, remarkable in the case that it kind of played out in front of all these pilots, you know, mm -hmm. the, four, the four eyewitnesses and then the radar witnesses uh, back on the ships are all looking at this um, intercept happen and they're all listening, even um, the the USS Princeton can hear 
talk back um, in their control room of these pilots. So they're hearing the radio calls, these concern calls of, you know, they basically have contact, you know, they're engaged with um, something. Um, again, it would be wonderful to have those recordings, which we don't from, from what I understand of those radio calls. But, um, you know, this object begins mirroring him and they're coming down. He's coming down in altitude. And at some point he decides that he's going to um, take an aggressive um, movement to try to bring this object on his nose. And so he uh, turns his jet rapidly to the right and dives down to gain speed and momentum and quickly um, bring the, the nose of his jet to point ahead of this object, this 47 foot long Tic Tac, which is approximately a mile away from him at this point. And in my film, you know, there's some very good visuals that I did recreations where I, you know, calculated those distances and, and put the objects in perspective of what it looked like at like a mile away across the circle. And so as he does this, almost immediately the object, you know, reacts to him by turning towards him. Again, one end of it turns towards him. And it just basically flies past the, like, hi, he says hypersonic. Like, it was gone in, like, a blink of an eye. Like, one second. It's there, and it's gone, past beyond the horizon. And they all saw this happen. Um, you know, all four of these pilots saw this thing just, like, phew, gone. Mm -hmm. um, and they're just left going, did that just happen? Mm -hmm. um, and so then, of course, you know, they're, they're going to um, call. You know, I think what they did... Uh, before you know they they laugh they won't because people ask me this and i didn't have it in the movie they're like what happened to the thing in the ocean what where did that what happened to the the ufo in the ocean and I, i'm like well they went back to the disturbance and it was gone there was mm -hmm. no trace of it on the surface of the ocean um after this dog fight um next the next thing that happens is they call back to the princeton and the princeton uh Radar, you know, the air, air traffic control um, poison, I believe, says, sir, you're not going to believe this, but that object um, that you were tracking, it's now at your cap point. And that was surprising because the cap point is not known by anyone. First of all, it's a classified coordinate um, that the fighter jets basically go to um, after they launch um, they would go to the cap point to form up with other planes and get ready to go off and do their mission and you know when they're in when they're done with their mission they sometimes fly back to their cap point before they land on the carrier so the fact that this object was basically sitting on their cap point was a little disconcerting to the pilots like how did they know where our cap point was and how far so, away was the cap point it's my understanding it was about 40 miles away and that's the other pr problem how did they get to the cap point that fast you know uh -huh. i mean in a jet it's not that far but this thing was like there apparently like within seconds mm -hmm. so and the cap useful. point yeah 40 miles away is pretty far and for you know this thing to yeah. choose any place to go to yeah that's pretty weird yeah. i know that, I mean, that it, it, you know a white capsule how i mean it, it makes it it begs a lot of questions as to how it knew where the cat point was. Mm -hmm. It was, a, could it listen into, you know, whoever w was in con controlling, it was obviously intelligently controlled. Could they listen into military radio, you know, secure radio? Um, was this was a cat point that they had met at earlier in the day when they began their training? That's so, my understanding. So they maybe it observed one, them. They can have more than one cat point. Hmm. Um, but David Fravor just said the cat point. So I'm assuming that, yeah, yeah, correct. They could have observed if they had gone there before and loitered there for a while before they, um, you know, it could have, you're absolutely correct. You know, so fascinating. And you know, what is really fascinating about this case is like Nick Pope said, or like we were referring to earlier, mm -hmm. Especially if you look at Blue Book, because really that's the m biggest record we have of military cases. Um, mm -hmm. You see this over and over again, even with other yeah. militaries in Chile, in uh, Brazil, you know, um, where 
an object is spotted, jets are scrambled, they kind mm-hmm. of have a little bit of a cat and mouse uh, before the object just shoots off at an amazing speed. 1952 yeah. over Washington, D.C., same thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's shocking. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really interesting to look at a craft that doesn't seem to have any type of propulsion system based on conventional aviation and aeronautics. Um, it doesn't have flight surfaces, control surfaces, nasials that, you know, might be a jet engine, um, propellers. You know, it doesn't have, seem, these objects oftentimes don't seem to have anything, yet they're able to um, jet away at, like, unbelievable speeds, you know, mm-hmm. let alone hover and fly around at all. So you have probably seen the executive uh, report that George mm-hmm. Knapp leaped. Um, through yes. KLAS. And that's a pretty extraordinary document. Um, I guess my first question will be, uh, what is your understanding of the origins of that document? Well, again, you know, um, George, you know, revealed that document um, on his I-Team KLAS investigation. Um, you know, my understanding is that that document was produced at a briefing that was um, set up with Mr. Reed, Senator Reed. Hmm. Um, I mean, I guess that I would say it came from ATIP. It either came from ATIP or it came from Bass and you know Bigelow's company during the DIA contract, the OSAP program that George also um, revealed. Um, I think that those those investigations and studies were done during that program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from what I understand, it was written by the military for the military. It's a term. Right. um, But the reason I ask is it's it's fascinating in Mm -hmm. that. I know Fravor speaks to it and says, you know, that's Mm -hmm. accurate. Um, Yeah. And that there was a sub in the area uh, as part of the strike group that didn't hear anything Mm -hmm. under the water, which is kind of strange because they visually Mm -hmm. saw something. But um, what's interesting about that report is some of the assumptions that are made. Like they they speculate. I shouldn't say they don't assume because they do call it Mm -hmm. out as uh, speculation. But it seems in the report they feel pretty strongly that uh, the potential that something was under the water and it just might not have been able to be picked up by their well that's very very perceptive and there was a whole discussion about that i think last week in in my facebook group Mm. i brought up the point that why are there two observables listed in the executive summary that don't seem to be attached to any witnesses i said the other observables flight characteristics of these unknowns seem to be backed up by Commander Fravor and Kevin Day and um, the other witnesses that were there that day. But there's these two, um, one one being that the object could cloak, said possibly cloak, <clears throat> become invisible to the eye and radar systems. And the other one, as you mentioned, was that it possibly could operate under sea and avoid detection. So, yeah, it's kind of interesting. I would I would love to know how they came to that conclusion. Maybe it was based on the fact that the submarine, the USS Louisville, did not hold a sonar contact contact on that day. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. That, it, they're very strong statements. I guess maybe because the Hawkeye couldn't see it. Um, mm-hmm. and why they yeah. think it had some sort of stealth property. Of course, it had very smooth. It was like a tic tac. So I don't know, maybe the roundedness yeah, of it I or mean, something. It, if it, if they thought it could cloak, obviously somebody must have reported that it disappeared, and maybe you know it just took off at a high speed, and they thought it disappeared. But it's an interesting uh, ob- observation for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh huh. Go ahead. So so <clears throat> you just mentioned the Hawkeye. Um, yeah. One of the new witnesses that came forward, and um, I've vetted these these guys pretty well. I mean, they're telling me a story. Obviously, I don't have proof, but um, I know who they are, and I did check their backgrounds. Um, one of the people that came forward said that he was in the E2 Hawkeye, um, you know, that was on scene. There may have been one or two that were in the air that day, and he said he told me that um, they saw the Tic Tac. 
which is not in any other report. He said that um, at one point in the flight, um, everyone in that crew saw an object that sort of for a few seconds it formed up on their Hawkeye and then took off. At the and same said, day? You know, yeah. Wow. Um, and he, I said, well, you know, um, I asked him a few questions. He's very reluctant to talk to me. Um, mm. he, he claims that um, after the flight, when they landed in the Hawkeye, that he was um, he and the crew were taken into a secure area on the ship, sort of debriefed about this event, told that it didn't happen, don't talk about it. And he says he um, had to sign a non-disclosure agreement. And so the fact that he was even admitting that he was there said, you know, he couldn't, first of all, um, go on the record. And um, he didn't want to talk about it too much based on that. Hmm. Yeah. So it's not the, the strongest primary witness, but quite interesting that this guy is saying that, you know, the whole crew of the E2 Hawkeye saw the Tic Tac. Mm hmm. Yeah. That, uh, yeah, because there's more eyewitnesses than to this object. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and there are none of the reports. It's strange to me a little bit because um, I know that both, you know, A Tip and TTSA and all of the groups that were studying this. In fact, um, going back to Paco Cherichi uh, from Fighter Sweep, he, he told me that he when he wrote his, his article, he said that he used the Naval Intelligence Services NIS report that was classified. And he thought that the executive summary was very similar to the NIS report that he used. Oh, so. that is really interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. And, but in none of those reports does it say that the Hawkeye crew saw anything. But then again, this guy said they had to sign NDAs. So mm -hmm. maybe they <laughs> kept their mouth shut, you know? Yeah. Um, there, There's another reason, too, that they might not yeah. have spoken. I'll get into that. But I, what were you okay. going to mention just now? Well, the the original person that came forward um, with the Wallbanger Squadron um, is willing to, you know, talk and tell his story. His name is P.J. Hughes. Um, he was on the Nimitz that day. His job was an aviation technician. And he describes it as like, you know, when the Hawkeyes take off, they basically get the planes ready for the air crews to um, board them and so on. They um, make sure that all maintenance concerns are addressed and the radios and the crypto radios are programmed properly Um you know, so that the pilots just get on and are ready to fly the mission. He says that when his friends um, Hawkeye landed that day, <clears throat> they got off the plane and left. He took the secure data bricks, they call them off the plane. And these are highly classified um, intelligence gathering drives that contain um, data link information. It's like a type of radar stuff that the uh, strike group uses very sophisticated and his job was to take him downstairs to his shop put him in a in the in the hawkeyes um shop secure safe um he even described the safe as being like a safe that requires two people to open um so he they they logged the serial numbers of these drives and and hour or so later there's a knock at his door in the shop and his commanding officer is there with what he describes are two United States Air Force officers or personnel, and they want the hard drive. And so PJ says, well, okay, they have to get another guy to open up the safe. They give him this hard drive, and the guy says, sign him out to me, the commanding officer. He's like, sign out the hard drive to me because you won't be getting him back. And the commanding officer and the two Air Force guys leave, and the last thing you ever saw them. <laughs> So hmm. that's a very interesting story that has not been told um, by any of the previous um, reports we've seen. Mm-hmm. That is yeah. a really interesting story. And what's interesting also, I mean, that that's a super interesting, of course, and there's so much to get into, and we're about yeah. out of time. But the I last... know, I'm just dropping, I'm dropping that bomb on you right now. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh... You're blowing my mind. But... Um, the he other said, oh, by the way, I, people said, oh, maybe he was, I go, he's like, Dave, he goes, I know what Navy flight suits look like. I know what Army flight suits look like. These were 
United States Air Force flight suits with insignia on them. Mm -hmm. I did not mistake who I was looking at. That's what PJ told me. So, And I think that makes sense. I mean, it makes perfect sense. Of course, this has been in their purview for a long time. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and that's, that's the hard part where we've all been looking at who's looking at this, where do these records reside? And we haven't yeah. answered that question, but that makes sense. Well, you know, going back to this case, um, Commander Fravor has, you know, said over and over that no one ever said not to talk mm -hmm. no one ever took anything no one ever even mentioned this they just made fun of us this was not classified you know they made a joke of it when we got back that's been portrayed over and over and over but all of a sudden i'm hearing this other alternate story that wait people were told it didn't happen sign here don't ever talk about it where's the hard drive you know the air force is here to take them you know like that's kind of a different story but again you know it is a story, so. Mm -hmm. But what isn't is, uh, you know, and this is in the executive uh, report, and they made a big deal about it, is uh -huh. this high level of ridicule that these guys faced when they got back yeah, to the aircraft carrier, which yeah, is, right? I mean, a little bit telling, and it's, it's disappointing, but it also mm -hmm. demonstrates a very... Um, strongly what we've heard from other military and stuff is why someone would be hesitant to talk about anything. Yeah, that's true. Because from I my mean, understanding, and I think you you probably know this as well, at least yeah. one of the pilots or one of the people involved, uh, maybe more, got extremely ups upset about this ridicule. Yeah, that's right. I mean, um, I mean, we've seen it, you know, um, if you follow the subject, you see it in the media a lot. I was kind of um, disheartened by the Fox News um, one interview that they did where they started out with the kind of mocking, um, you know, UFO um, alien implant stuff. And then they cut directly to Commander Fravor, these military heroes. Those guys didn't see that. I mean, they're sitting there in a studio and they're really being sort of mocked, really. And you mm -hmm. may know the, the show that I'm talking about, but... When they, I think when they got back on the ship, the same thing happened. There was the tinfoil hats and like mm -hmm. jokes about the X Files and <clears throat> Little Green Men, and yeah, it makes you want to kind of just like not talk about it, you know. Mm -hmm. And especially in these, you know, these very high testosterone sort of yeah. environments, because you hear cops say the same thing often, mm -hmm. and because uh, we like to, you know. Guys are often making yeah. fun of each other and stuff. And although it's fun in games, it doesn't. You know, guys have feelings, and they don't want to be the butt of ridicule well, or be called. If this is yeah. If this is your career and you have a a, a security clearance, and you're flying multi million dollar aircraft that are armed to the teeth. You know, you're the guy that saw the UFO, huh? Right. Well, right. That could follow you. So. It takes a lot of uh, courage to step forward, and most of these guys are retired, and that's why they're able to do that. I could see why somebody that's active duty would just like shut their mouth and not ever want to talk about it because of that possible career-ending move, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. We're out of time, but I want you to share with people where they can find you, where they can find more information. So, for instance, uh, the Facebook mm -hmm. group you mentioned, what's it called, and how can people participate? Yeah, reach out to me on Facebook, Dave C. Beatty. You can uh, message me there. Uh, the website is uh, www.thenimitzencounter, with an S, dot com. And um, also the Nimitz Encounters on Facebook. Um, you can find information about the film and uh, some research I did and some of the documents we talked about today. That is so awesome. Thank you so much for all of this great work that you're doing in this incredible video and thank you so much for being on the show thank you alejandro i appreciate it thank you so much to dave Beatty for being on the show you've got to see his video if you haven't seen it yet really you can just google the nimitz encounter youtube that's what i do usually to find it and it's got 1.4 million hits so you know it's very popular so it pops right up but you can also do that uh in facebook 
and look for the nimitzencounters.com and find out more about uh, this great video and some of the stuff that he's into following up with witnesses. And uh, so he's done some great work. Uh, it was a great pleasure to have him on the show. I also want to let you know about a couple other things. Uh, in the, the show links, you can see my Patreon site, and that's where you can find some of the other stuff I'm, I'm doing. Uh, of course, my openminds.tv stuff, you can find that there. But uh, my Den of Geek stories and others. And sometimes I'll link to those stories in from openminds.tv as well so you'll be able to find some but if you go look for alejandro t rojas on patreon you'll find all of that stuff and more and i also remind want to remind you about the ufo congress so uh, we're still working on the congress itself but there'll be new information up shortly but the store has so much cool stuff in it so Go to store.ufocongress.com or just ufocongress.com or find the link below, depending on how you're listening or viewing this, um, and you'll be able to check it out. We've got these cool pocket watches. Uh, we've got some baby clothes, all kinds of stuff that we're putting up in the next day or two. So check that out. Really cool stuff. Plus, we got to buy, pay the bill. So bye, bye, bye. And we will ship, 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 and you'll have some cool UFO and alien products. Otherwise, I want to thank Martin Willis from Podcast UFO for joining us for the news as usual. I want to thank Caleb Hanks for the opening and close music. I want to thank Systematics for the bumper music. And of course, as usual, I want to thank you, the listener, for being here once again. We'll have another great show next week. Until then... Adios, muchachos. 